In this video, we're going to look at the current state of Unity Dots and ECS and what has changed in these past few months. There's been lots of great improvements that makes it much easier to use and still has epic performance as usual. Let's begin! Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and this channel is all about helping you learn how to make your own games with in-depth tutorials made by a professional indie game developer. So if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing. So back in May, I first got into Unity Dots and ECS and spent a long time learning and playing around with it. In total, I made 12 videos on a whole bunch of topics related to Dots and ECS, which you can find in the playlist in the description. And now while Dots and ECS has improved significantly since then, I'm happy to say there haven't been many breaking changes. So if you're completely new to Unity Dots, you can go through all those videos in the playlist and pretty much all of it is still accurate. The improvements have been more related to quality of life, making it easier to write super fast dots code, as well as making it work with game objects and automatically converting them into entities. So here I will go over some of the larger changes since that time. If you want to learn more about dots in ECS, then go check out that playlist and then come back here to see what changed. For example, let's start with one of the biggest changes. This was announced back in the Unite keynote, and that's doing simple entities for each inside a job component system. So if you go through those videos, you'll see that to make a job, first you create the job struct, then create the job instance, set the data, and schedule it. Now all of that still works, but using entities for each, you can really cut down on the amount of code needed. Another awesome thing is automatically generating a mono behavior component to be used in the editor. I'm going to go over all of these changes, and we'll test them out as we go along. So over here I have my project set up with dots. As you can see, I'm using entities version 0.4. I also have Burst along with Jobs and the Hybrid Render package. Okay, so first of all, back then I was under the impression that as Dots went along, it would eventually come with a Dots editor so you wouldn't use game objects at all. However, in reality, rather than starting everything from scratch, over the past few months the focus has been to improve the conversion workflow. That way you can still use the editor like you've always done, and everything gets automatically converted into entities as soon as you run your game. So here, for example, let's make a simple object like always. So we make an empty game object, let's call this our player, and inside we add a mesh filter. And for our mesh, let's select a simple quad, then let's add a mesh renderer, and for the visual, let's drag this material with a sprite. And yep, just like this, here we have a very simple sprite, as we've always done. Now, in order to convert this from a game object into an entity, all we need to add is the component convert to entity. Just by adding this component, as soon as the game runs, this game object will be converted into an entity representation and then it will be destroyed. If you're using custom components, then naturally you need to handle the conversion yourself, but for all normal Unity components, like the mesh filter, mesh render, and so on, it's all automatic. So if I run the game right now, and yep, there you go, the sprite is still there, just as normal. However, if we pause and look at the hierarchy, yep, there you go, our game object is now gone. And now we can go into Window, Analysis, check the Entity Debugger, and there you go, over here we can see our player entity. So the Convert to Entity script automatically constructed this entity based on the components we had in our game object. So in those videos, I made pretty much all of it straight through code, which again, still works and is a valid approach, but right now, thanks to the Conversion Entity workflow, you can do what you've always done in the editor using game objects and simply add the Convert to Entity script. Another very important and very useful change is automatically making authoring components. So for example, let's try making a simple component. So in here, we just make a new c -sharp script. Let's call this the move direction. And now inside, let's get rid of mono behavior and all of this. And instead, let's make a simple component. So first we add using unity.entities, and then we add a public struct. Let's call this our move direction, and we implement iComponent data. Then inside of our component, let's add just a simple field. So a public float called value. Okay, so here we have a very basic component with a single value. However, just like this, if I go back into the editor, here's my script, here's my player, and if I try to drag it, yep, there you go, we have an error. We cannot add components if they do not derive from mono behavior. However, I can go back into the code, and now we can add the new attribute called generate authoring component. This will automatically generate a mono behavior proxy for this component. So now I can go back and now I can select my player and drag the script and yep, there you go, it is exactly like that, our move direction authoring component. Now I can modify the value to put whatever I want. 
So all you need is this simple attribute, and you can play around with the components as if they were normal mono behavior scripts. So again, this goes back to making the conversion workflow very easy to use. Now that we have our component and our player automatically converted into an entity, let's look at the entities for each. So for that, let's make our system. So we make a new script, call this our player movement system. Now here we have our script. And again, this is not a mono behavior. Instead, this is a job component system, which again is inside unity.entities. So here we have our job component system with our on update. And now previously, back when I made those videos, we had to make a job struct with all of our job logic. So we have to make something like a struct, my job, and implement i job, i job for each, or anything like that. So essentially, we had to build a struct and then initialize the struct inside of our job update. So that still works. However, right now, it's much simpler to make a simple job. Here in the update, we can use entities.for each. So here we take in a lambda function. And if you've worked in normal component systems, then you already know how this for each is so simple. Previously, I would normally do a single threaded component system first to get all the logic working, then I would convert it into a job. Now we can just straight do all of that here on the job. So here inside of our Lambda, let's do a for each and cycle through all the entities with a translation and move direction components. Okay, so we cycle through all the translation and move direction. And now here we can also define which components are read and which are read write. So if we want it to be read only, like for example, the move direction, then we add the in keyword. And if we want it to read and write, then we add the ref keyword. So in this case, we want to read and write onto the translation, but only read the move direction. So now inside of our for each, let's simply move the translation based on the move direction. So we're going to move the translation.value.x and increase it by the move direction.value. And in order to make it frame rate independent, let's also multiply it by delta time. So we need to grab delta time outside of the job. So outside of the job for each. So in here, we make a float for our delta time. And inside, we can use it. All right, so here we have our very simple job, moving the translation based on the move direction. Now, just like this, we are setting up the job. Then we need to actually schedule it. So after doing our for each, we call schedule and we pass our input dependencies. And after scheduling, this returns our job handle. So we simply store our job handle and we can return our job handle. So let's test. And yep, there you go. There's our sprite constantly moving to the right. And in the entity debugger, we can see our player movement system working on the player. So again, here's our job component system working with a simplified for each syntax. If you compare it to the older videos, you'll see that this helps in cutting down the amount of code needed by quite a massive amount. Now in here, you can schedule it, which will be run by the job system. However, you can also make it run on just a single thread. So instead of schedule, we just call run. And if we run, this does not return a job handle. So instead in here, we can return just default. And then up here, we can add the attribute always synchronize system. This forces all dependencies to run and synchronize before running this one. So if we run this, and yep, there you go, there's our sprite constantly moving to the right. So everything still works. Now, previously, when you defined a job struct, you had to add the burst compile attribute in order for it to use burst. However, now it's the opposite. By default, everything will use burst. And if you need to do something that is not allowed with burst, then over here on the entities, you can add the filter without burst. So by default, your code will run super fast with burst. And if you find a burst error in the console, then you just need to add this filter. Next, we have two things which have completely different names. So if you run the code exactly as it is in those videos, you need to change them in order to run. So inside using unity.collections, you have the various dots collections. For example, you have a native queue. And in order to write to it, you would make a native queue.concurrent. In order to get it, you would go into the native queue and you would call to concurrent. Now the behavior still works the same. However, now it has been renamed into the parallel writer and then as parallel writer. 
So it works exactly the same, just the name that change. Now another breaking change is regarding the active world. So whenever you need to access the world to get something like the entity manager, you would do world.active and find the entity manager. However, right now, the correct way to do this is instead we use world.defaultGameObjectInjectionWorld. So this is the world where all of your game objects that have automated conversion will go into. This was changed because that may or may not be the currently active world. So in those videos, when you see world.active, you can replace it with world.defaultGameObjectInjectionWorld. Now, one more thing that is not something that actually changed, but rather something I haven't covered yet and has been doing great progress, and that's dots physics. Again, this is all being done so that the normal conversion workflow makes it super easy to use. So here in my project, I also installed the Unity Physics package. And in order to use it, we just go into add component and we add a regular normal rigid body component. And just like this, if we now run the game, and if there you go, there's my sprite falling along with gravity. So as you can see, the normal rigid body component gets automatically converted into a dots physics rigid body. So I can also add a sphere collider, and then for example, add this bouncy material, and underneath, put another object. So here I have another object, just a basic wall, and again, just by running it, and there you go, we have physics working, and again, these are using dots physics, so we have nothing on our hierarchy. So look forward to a video dedicated to dots physics coming very soon. Also, one thing I want to point out, if you're still very new to dots, then one excellent learning tool you can use is visual scripting. I've done a video on it, and even if you have no interest in visual scripting itself, it can still be very useful because it's all dots based, and most importantly, contains a code viewer. So you can make a simple visual script, get used to the logic between entities, components, and systems, and then look at the code viewer to see how the underlying code works. For example, you'll be able to see the code viewer making queries and running entities for each. So even if you have no interest in visual scripting, you can still use it to learn how dots and ECS works. All right, so if you're completely new to Unity Dots and ECS, then go check out that playlist. Other than these minor changes, all of the code and structure shown in those videos is still valid. Now I plan to get back to making dots videos, especially since it's meant to come out of preview in just a couple of months, so the future looks very exciting. Let me know in the comments what type of dots content would you like to see. Maybe a complete simple game, maybe a showcase like the Marines vs Zombies videos, maybe some specific system. Let me know in the comments. As always, you can download the project files and utilities from unitycodemuck.com. Subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials, post any questions you have in the comments, and I'll see you next time.